We get asked very frequently, as you can imagine, <laughs> about the value of the crown jewels. And the only answer that we can give is that they are simply priceless because they are of completely immeasurable uh, symbolic, historic and cultural value. And therefore, they really are a priceless collection. So here we are now. I'm with Charles Farris, who's a public historian here at the Tower of London. Charles, where to begin? Let's start with the building directly behind you. The uh, White Tower. The White Tower. Well, yeah, let's start with the White Tower, because that's the, is that the oldest part of where we are? That is, yes. Yeah. So, uh, well, there are some earlier Roman remains, but we can't see them all from here. So let's start with the, <laughs> the obvious one. This is the White Tower, begun by William the Conqueror, not long after the Norman Conquest in 1066, and, uh, and, and finished by, uh, well, monarchs for hundreds of years after that. The actual White Tower was finished by about... 1090, 1100, um, but then the tower has expanded almost continually since, um, although its current footprint is probably round about where it, uh, as we see it today, was from about sort of 1400, it reached its full size. But what I think you perhaps are referring to is the Waterloo block just up there. That was built by the Duke of Wellington, who was a constable here at the Tower of London. That's the ceremonial head of the Tower of London. And uh, he built that after a terrible fire there in the 1840s. And that is, of course, the home of the crown jewels today. Now, basically what I'm here for is when we're all watching the coronation, we all want clever things to say. When the crowns come out and the spoon and the sword and the orbs. So take us through what we will be seeing, which normally lives in the jewel house behind you, a starring role in the coronation. What will we be seeing and what, what should we know about it? Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to take you back to uh, King Edward the Confessor. <laughs> Why not? So the coronation ceremony, of course, is a very ancient one. Uh, it's thousands of years old. And as historians, we have to piece together how this developed over time. The ceremony is roughly uh, has all its key elements uh, and has done for about a thousand years, including the anointing, prayers, blessings, processions, things like that, but also the bestowal of regalia, these objects, these symbols of kingship, which represent the powers and responsibilities of the monarch. And in the medieval period, it was said that medieval kings and queens uh, and Tudor kings and queens afterwards were crowned with the crown of King Edward the Confessor. He died in 1066. He was later made a saint, buried in Westminster Abbey. And it was said that it was his regalia that was used to crown medieval kings and queens. However, that regalia was destroyed in 1649. There was an English civil war. They weren't planning on having any more kings or queens, no more coronations. And so the crown jewels were brought here to the Tower of London, broken up, taken to the Tower Mint, melted down and turned into gold coins. So that was perhaps meant to be the end of the story. But fortunately, it wasn't for us here at the Tower because in 1660, monarchy was restored. A new set of regalia or crown jewels had to be made for the coronation of King Charles II in 1661. And most of the collection that visitors see here in the jewel house at the Tower of London dates from the reign of King Charles II. There is one exception. There's a famous coronation spoon which survived from the earlier medieval regalia. And that still has an important part to play in the anointing of monarchs today. So we understand the crown, you put the crown on the king's head, that's, that is the coronation. Tell us about the role of the spoon. The spoon, well the spoon is used in the anointing, as I said it's an amazing object. In fact it's the only, this is a nice piece of trivia for your listeners, this is the only surviving item of the medieval coronation regalia and also the only surviving piece of 12th century royal goldsmith's work to survive. It's very beautiful, it's engraved with wonderful designs including a beautiful acanthus leaf spiral pattern um, and the oil is poured from what we call the eagle ampulla, that is a vessel made of gold in the shape of an eagle replacing an earlier one that was destroyed in 1649 and that oil is poured out from that vessel into the coronation spoon and then the archbishop dips his fingers into the oil and anoints the monarch what makes this even more exciting is this happens in secret this is the most sacred part of the ceremony it takes place underneath a golden canopy. And in uh, 1953, when famously the coronation was televised live, this was the only part that wasn't televised. Um, and and that's it still going to be the case for this coronation? 
Uh, I believe so. I yeah. think you'd, you'd, you'd have to check that one. I'm not sure, I'm sure exactly, but, um, but it, it, is, it is a very important and ancient part of the ceremony. And anointing, of course, goes back to the Old Testament. It's part of many inauguration ceremonies, but it's been part of the English coronation ceremony, at least going back to 973. That's the coronation of King Edgar, which took place at Bath. So it's more than a thousand years old. Wow. And if, if I wanted to buy that spoon, how much would it cost? Well, we get asked very frequently, as you can imagine, <laughs> about the value of the crown jewels. And the only answer that we can give is that they are simply priceless because they are of completely immeasurable uh, symbolic, historic and cultural value. And therefore, they really are a priceless collection. It's an occupational hazard of recording in, uh, in the grounds of the Tower of London. The sun you can hear in the background is marching soldiers to show that, you know, we are, we are where we say we are. Um, Tony, obviously there's a, there's a sort of line of tradition that a lot of the same uh, uh, crown and accoutrements are used in combinations, but combinations have changed over the years. Uh, bits get added, get, bits get removed. What would you say was the most flash combination uh, that we've seen? Well, very famously is the coronation of King George IV in 1821. And that has sort of gone down in history as perhaps being the most lavish, exuberant of coronations. Um, and it was also the last coronation where several uh, historic traditions took place. If I can go back to a slightly earlier coronation to talk about another coronation tradition that uh, no longer takes place. This is the great procession from the Tower of London. Um, this first took place, we know, uh, for the coronation of King Richard II in the 1300s, and last took place in 1661. And we're here on Tower Green um, at the Tower of London, and we're just in front of what is called the King's House. And this is the ceremonial home of the Constable of the Tower of London. And we know that King Charles II, shortly before his coronation procession, which went from the Tower of London through the streets of London to Westminster, the day before his coronation, just before he left, he had breakfast in the King's House behind us. So that's a nice, nice little um, uh, story, I think. So, but, so the crown jewels sort of were paraded from here to Westminster? The, Ah, so there was a regalia procession inside Westminster Abbey. No, this was more of a civic procession. Oh, okay. So there would have been lots of pageantry. We are told that all the fountains in the city were made to run with wine. There were trumpets, there were drums. All the streets were lined with precious cloth. Also, special stages were put up and little plays were put on for the king to witness as they went round. And it was quite a, a, an amazing spectacle. Then they arrived at Westminster, prepared themselves for the ceremony the next day in Westminster Abbey and of course Westminster Abbey has been the home of coronations since the coronation of uh, William the Conqueror in 1066 which actually took place on Christmas Day. It might not have been the first in fact because maybe Harold earlier that year might have had his coronation there but the records don't quite tell us that much. That's a good fact, Christmas Day 1066. Yes. So go on then, tell me about the very very flash coronation. Okay so King George the Fourth coronation in 1821 has sort of gone down in history as one of being the, one of the most um, uh, exuberant as you said um, amazing spectacles uh, in history and uh, also uh, you know, one of the most expensive. Don't ask me for the cost <laughs> because uh, I'm very good and very bad with figures, but uh, it was an incredibly lavish event. One of the things that made it amazing was the costume that everyone wore. They wore amazing ceremonial robes and King George IV actually took a keen interest in designing these himself. The reason for this, yes, yeah, sorry, as well as marching, we also have lots of bells here at the <laughs> tower, so uh, your listeners can enjoy that. But um, recently there had been, uh, in, in, in the early 1800s, the coronation of Napoleon, which had taken place in Paris, and, 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 and George IV was very conscious of competing with that. He wanted to compete with uh, his competitors in terms of exuberance on the continent, and so he very much kept an eye on what had gone on there. And so when he designed the coronation robes, examples of which we actually still have today, which is amazing, in the Royal Ceremonial Dress Collection, which is kept at Hampton Court Palace, and we have examples of the amazing clothes that were worn for that occasion. They're very hard to date because although they were partly inspired by those uh, robes of Napoleon, um, they were also taking their cue from Tudor and Stuart dress as well. So, but they're made in the most amazing fabrics. They're made in silks, they're made in gold, lots of wonderful materials. So the dress is spectacular. The service is spectacular. It goes on all day. But what I think your listeners will be really excited about is the coronation banquet. This is the last yeah. time the great coronation banquet took place in Westminster Great Hall in the Palace of Westminster. 
And this really was the sort of meal to end all meals, if you like. Um, and quite literally, they never had another coronation banquet in the Great Hall afterwards. Um, over 3,000 people attended, all wearing these amazing Tudor-esque uh, robes made of the, 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 the finest materials. There were also thousands more noble spectators in the sort of great seatings above. Literally just watching people eating. Just watching people <laughs> eating. And uh, that gets complicated at the end of the meal. I'll uh, explain that in a moment. But they had an amazing meal. The, the, the menu is absolutely eye-watering. Amazing wine list. Amazing table decorations made from silver and gold. Um, and there's also a lot of pageantry as well. The most famous part of this is when the king's champion, who would arrive at the banquet, he would arrive in full armour, on horseback, ride into the banquet and just challenge everyone in the room basically to a fight or a duel if they dare challenge the authority of the king. Of course, nobody did that. Um, and then he received a gold cup from the king and then rode out. So you can imagine going to a <laughs> dinner where a knight arrives in full armour uh, and challenges you to a duel. That's pretty memorable. That sounds amazing. And then what happened with the crowds? Well, it all, it, it all got a little bit rowdy at the end. So we, there's wonderful accounts of this and lots of people re reported it and wrote letters about it because it was such an amazing event. For a start, it was incredibly hot. It was a hot day. Um, there were thousands, literally thousands of candles in candelabra and chandeliers around the room. Um, and also the sort of corridors adjacent had gas lighting as well so they're funneling heat into the room and there's thousands and thousands of diners as well so it starts to get very hot by the end of the meal people are literally fainting but nobody wants to leave because this is the spectacle to end all spectacles it's the the, the 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 banquet to end all banquet so people are fainting also the drip pans of the chandeliers above that were meant to collect the wax quickly filled up and so the ceiling literally starts raining with molten wax and if you were unlucky enough to be sat directly underneath one and we were told that people were so jammed in they couldn't then move um, you suddenly <laughs> in your finery got absolutely covered in wax and then after the king leaves about eight o'clock at night he's had enough goes home uh, uh, at the end of the banquet then things get very complicated because basically a lot of the nobles who had been invited but not to eat were probably a bit ravenous by this point and they come down um, into the Great Hall itself like a pitch invasion <laughs> literally and they start helping themselves not just to the food but also they start taking souvenirs as well they take cutlery and glasses <laughs> and table decorations they have to put an armed guard on the chapel where they put all the royal plate to make sure no one tries to take that home um, and they were anticipating some sort of a fracas at the event famously the king had employed a number of professional boxers sort of like great celebrity boxers of his age to act as sort of doorman um, for the event partly um, probably for sort of star appeal but also you know to act as security so so one of the most amazing uh, spectacles in the history of coronations uh, ends, as you say, in a, in a bit of a riot. I was going to ask you why it didn't happen again, but I think we've answered that, that, that question as to why we don't get a big Westminster Hall dinner uh, for, the, for the coronation this time. Well, William IV, who was the, the next uh, monarch to have a coronation, he was a completely different uh, temperament to George IV, and he didn't want any of this. He wanted it very much pared back. And so, um, though uh, his coronation was a much simpler affair, it still had... Um, a lot of the traditions and the regalia etc but they didn't have a lot of the the grand spectacle which had been seen at George IV's coronation and uh, it was obviously decided that uh, this was probably the way to go they didn't have to have even though they're always amazing spectacles and amazing sort of um, evocative spectacles of like history and tradition you know something on the scale of George IV probably wasn't necessary. Yeah, probably best to avoid the drunken riot. That's, I can see that that would be the case. We should talk about the things which don't get to go to the coronation, and in particular, uh, the, 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 the crown worn by the Queen, Queen Mother, the controversial diamond. Tell us about that. Well, there's um, a number of objects which um, don't... Oh, which aren't always used in the in the in the in the coronations. Um, the as you mentioned, the crown of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, that was uh, made for the coronation of uh, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth um, in 1937, and that is set, as you said, with the Kohinoor diamond. The crown that we've been told will be worn by uh, Her Majesty Queen Camilla um, and used for her coronation um, on the 6th of May is. Uh, Queen Mary's crown, which was made in 1911 for the coronation of Queen Mary and King George V. And uh, it was then used um, later 
uh, worn by the uh, by Queen Mary at her cor at her son's coronation in 1937. So this is one of a, a number of uh, coronations where that crown has been worn, and it's a very very beautiful crown, and it'd be very exciting to see it. Um, and I suppose that's the that's the shape of coronations over the over time. The, the different bits get picked and chosen and added, um, and probably less controversial than than Charles and Camilla having brand new crowns made. Well, it's always been personal choice throughout history um, what objects are used. There are traditionally uh, objects which are used um, in the ceremony. For example, um, St Edward's crown, which is named after Edward the Confessor. That is used for the actual moment of crowning. Although, hasn't always been the case. Because I mentioned George IV earlier, who had that very most lavish of coronations. Unsurprisingly, he wanted to break with tradition. And he had just commissioned a new state crown, um, an amazing, uh, huge crown which was set only with diamonds so imagine a very large crown set only with diamonds something like 12,000 diamonds um, and he loved this crown so much that he wanted to be crowned with it so he was crowned with this crown and he then uh, but the diamonds were actually hired specially for the occasion because they couldn't afford to buy them at the time and he begged parliament to let him keep the diamonds and to pay for them uh, uh, but they refused so in the end he had to give the diamonds back and what's quite sweet as stories go is the fact that uh, before he gave it back he had a cast made of this crown set with all the diamonds so he could remember it by so an, uh, 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 <laughs> uh, an amazing keepsake of what I'm sure was a very memorable day for him. So when you're watching the coronation what will be the thing that you'll be keeping an eye out for? The thing you're, that, you know, you're so used to seeing them up close here. Mm -hmm. Suddenly they're on the world stage being watched right around the world. What's the thing that, that you're most excited about? Uh, I, I don't think I could put a label on what I'm most excited about. I think it's just going to be, uh, this is the first coronation in my lifetime. I've obviously seen uh, images of coronations of the past, videos of coronations of the past, but this is the first one I'll witness. Mm -hmm. And as a sort of historian who uh, works with the crown jewels, who works at the Tower of London, who spends so much time reading about these amazing objects and the history of this collection and the history of coronations and kings and queens. To actually witness one of these events, to see the procession, the regalia, the, 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 the blessings, you know, that's going to be just incredibly exciting for me in general. So uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to pick a favourite. Just finally, when you're, when you're in there and you're, you're working with the crown jewels, do you ever pop it on your head? <laughs> I don't ever touch the oh. crown jewels. I'm, uh, I, 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 uh, I, I, I help our visitors to explore yeah. them. I research them, and that's an amazing privilege to do so. But uh, no, uh, I, 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 I never get to handle anything. Charles, really good to speak to you. Thanks so much. For, for, thanks very much for, 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 for giving this sort of guided tour of history. Well, lovely. Thank you, and I, uh, I hope your listeners enjoy it and enjoy the coronation as well.